There we go. Okay. So this is a listening session. Um, so I don't want to talk too much, but I do want to provide a bit of background before we get started. A link to a document has been put into the chat for your convenience. The document is the framework that outlines how the feasibility study is being conducted and provides additional information. So first and foremost, I wanna make sure everyone knows that no decisions have been made. Right now, I am collecting data in order to make a recommendation to the Board of Health. I anticipate presenting that recommendation at the September Board of Health meeting. The decision that they will be making in that meeting is whether to have me move to step two. And the purpose of step, the first step of this feasibility study is to figure out if separating from treatment services from SRHD is a good idea. And would it be in the public's best interest to separate? Some of you might be thinking, why would we consider such a thing since the opioid crisis is so bad in Spokane County? And truly, we are conducting this study now because, well, in part, because of the urgency of the situation. The treatment services program at SRHD is the singular largest opioid treatment program in Washington state. We serve approximately 1,000 active clients, but is that enough? Anecdotally, we know we are turning away at least five people a week who want to be assessed for admission into our program. If we were to separate from SRHD, would the no, new organization be able to move quickly and expand services to meet the needs, this, this increased need in our community? As a governmental agency, we are bound by governmental processes and we can't move quickly. Plus, our focus has to be on being wise stewards of taxpayer dollars. And last year, treatment services ended the year needing to be supplemented by the general fund, which is the taxpayer dollars. This hasn't happened very often, but it is a concern. Do the public health benefits of having treatment services under SRHD outweigh the cost to the taxpayer? There are some very public healthy things that we do at our treatment services program. Would an outside organization be able to continue these client focused services? We don't know. These are examples of a few of the questions that are being grappled with in the first part of this study. And I encourage you to read the framework for more information. Our hope for this evening is to hear from you about your thoughts on the possibility of treatment services separating from SRHD. We have held eight listening sessions with SRHD employees that were very informative and helpful. We now want to hear from community members. As Kelly indicated, we are taking your questions through the chat function of Zoom. The how to for doing that has been posted in the chat as well. We will take your questions and comments in the order that they are received in the chat. Questions that do not align with the feasibility study will be shared with me after this town hall. So with that, let's get started. And Kelly's going to share a slide that has some question prompts for you. And um, the first of those is, what concerns do you have 
about the potential of treatment services separating from SRHD. And do we have any questions in the chat yet? Let me take a look. And truly, you can ask any questions that you want. These are just simply prompts to help get you started in asking questions. So one question that is being asked is why is treatment services needing to turn away patients each week um, since they moved into a bigger building to accommodate more patients, <laughs> which I can understand that question. Right. So, um, and Misty might need to uh, jump in to help me answer this question, but we have a current staffing structure that allows a certain number of assessments to be conducted. Um, and an assessment of an individual um, is approximately a three hour process. Um, they have, there's just a, and Misty, I think I'm going to punt this to you. If you could describe the assessment process and why we have to limit it to a certain number of people, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. So our assessment process, as Alicia stated, takes approximately three hours, give or take. And that is because it takes the individual meeting with our administrative assistants at the front desk, uh, getting the initial paperwork completed, and then meeting with medical assistants, our providers, getting their health history information, their uh, usage history, as well as then following up with our, our substance use disorder professionals for a biopsychosocial assessment. And all of those pieces take a significant amount of time. After those components are done, it then requires um, providing a urinalysis sample and going into the dispensary and receiving their first dosage. And all of those pieces are, are moving parts to the entire process. And we have specific staff that have to do each of those steps. And as Alicia alluded to, that takes time and structure and organization, and we can only uh, have staff doing so, so many staff doing those pieces at one any one time and so it is a staffing structure mm -hmm. and so just to add to what misty just described in order to expand our ability to increase the number of assessments being conducted we would have to expand our staffing and that goes back to um being nimble and responsive to the need, um, following governmental processes, we have to currently make sure that we have the funding to cover the additional staff. And just an additional to that question, you mentioned that this past year there was um, a budget shortage mm -hmm. on, with treatment services. Can you explain where that that came from or how that came to be? Like, oh, well, is, okay. Yeah. Sure. So um, what, with the pandemic, there was, um, when the pandemic was ended, there was a change in um, how Medicaid was um, being administered. So throughout the pandemic, People who were on Medicaid weren't required to follow the standard process of following up to make sure they stayed on Medicaid. Everybody was kept on Medicaid who was on Medicaid currently, and they were adding people to the Medicaid roles. And when the pandemic ended, those, those, um, uh, what's the word, the, they went back to their old way of requiring everyone to uh, re-up their eligibility for Medicaid. And unfortunately, what happened is a lot of individuals were kicked off Medicaid. And we believe that that is one of the reasons why our enrollment dropped um, the number of clients that we were serving dropped 
significantly down to around 800. And that, that caused the shortfall in income because it is a fee for service program. Um, we we uh, charge fees, people pay for those fees, the majority of people pay through their insurance coverage with Medicaid being one of the types of insurance that we accept. And so when they no longer had that insurance coverage, then we, we assume that that's why our, our enrollment decreased significantly in 2023. Next question. I don't think we have any more questions that have come through. We might take a look at the topics again that you brought up. So I really do need to hear from folks about um, what are your concerns. So if you could share your concerns or um, uh, what do you want to make sure is being addressed as data is being collected um, so I can speak to those, those concerns and those issues, um, I would, it would be very helpful. Um, and also, if you can think of potential benefits of having treatment services uh, being run by a private business, uh, we would also like to hear those through the chat. Do we have any more? No, oh, but let's get one that come through. Oh, we just had a few new people joining on in the waiting room. So, another. and another. So for those of you that just joined us, I'm going to reiterate that there is a link in the chat right now that will take you to the um, feasibility study Framework, framework. <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, you can take a peek at that. But also, I'm going to reshare with you. We have some things that we want to hear from you. Um, concerns that you might have about treatment services, uh, the potential of them separating from SRHD. Um, what do you want to make sure is addressed as far as as data is being collected? And then are there potential benefits that you can see of treatment services being run by a private business rather than a governmental entity? And do you have thoughts on the potential impact of a private company running treatment services regarding access to care, treatment quality, and community needs? And is there anything else you want us to know as we move forward with the feasibility study? And so please put your comments and questions into the chat so that they can be addressed. Yeah, well, it's kind of quiet, but we'll give you guys just a couple more minutes for those of you that just joined us to enter your comments, questions. And also give us some feedback if you would prefer to um, have us like raise, have be able to raise your hand so that we can unmute you to speak. Just let us know. This is our first town hall, so we're um, wanting to be flexible and provide you with the opportunities to get your voice heard. So do we have any no, questions in no, the it's chat? Still quiet do we in have the any chat. hands raised? 
people watching it, but no, nothing is coming up. Um, I think that, you know, as we wind down, maybe a final message reiterating how you introduced just the final, yeah. what we want everyone to understand before right. we leave is mainly that this is a feasibility study. Yeah. And there's a lot of questions we're trying to get answered too. And that's the purpose of it. And, right. Um, right. So really yeah. we could, you and I could just talk about it <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that would help everybody to uh, get a better sense of what's happening. Um, so um, there's also some, I want to make sure everyone knows that there were, does there have been uh, discussions at the April 25th Board of Health meeting, the May, was it 26th or 27th? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the, <laughs> the Board of Health meetings are always on the last Thursday of the month, except August and November. Um, and so the in both the April and the May recordings of the Board of Health meeting, there was a pretty extensive conversation about the feasibility study. So those are available to you online. So if you want to learn more, you can watch those videos. And um, so what, what, you know, how did this even start? It started because there has been over the years the topic of is treatment services, are we, a, is it best served to be under a governmental entity such as SRHD? Because the vast majority of opioid treatment programs are private entities and in Washington state, currently there's only two that operate under a health department, ours and the opioid treatment program that is out of the Tacoma Pierce City County Health Department. And um, so as I mentioned early on, I know a number of you joined after I had uh, introduced this topic, but we are right now, like there's a critical um, crisis, really a crisis, um, opioid crisis in Spokane County. And our treatment services program is the singular largest opioid treatment program in Washington state. We serve um, approximately 1000 clients and we are concerned that there's a greater need and that the treatment services program should actually grow and expand. But we don't function as a business would function. We function as a governmental program and we have to function within the governmental uh, confines. And in plain language, what that means is that before we can bring additional employees on, we have to show that we have the funding. And we're in a situation where last year we did end the year in a deficit, um, which means that the taxpayer dollar had to cover the expenses that weren't covered by the revenue. And um, so the topic has come up, should we, should treatment services stay within the health district? It's come up many times over the years. And so we decided we being uh, the board of health and with my request to do this feasibility study to see if right now is the time to do this. And again, no decision has been made. We're just collecting information. Um, the purpose of this town hall is to get feedback 
from community members. What do you, what are your concerns? Uh, what do you wanna make sure is being addressed? Are there potential benefits? Um, what are your thoughts on the potential impact of a private company running treatment services, specifically around access to care, treatment quality, and community needs? And is there anything else you want to make sure that we cover as, as we move forward with this feasibility study? And so with that, has any comment, if quote, yes, oh good, so absolutely. there's some comments, uh, great, um, I'm great. gonna jump to one because you mentioned um, the deficit last year. And mm -hmm. so the question is that, um, was it a one-time effect or where we are right. now? And I think you have some good news right. to share about and, where we are and now. That, that is a great question because we, we've tracked uh, over 20 years of data showing, you know, how does treatment services end the year? And it is very, very rare. I think the last time we finished a year in the, in the red um, or a deficit, was 2008. So typically in a typical year, we do end with more revenue than expenses. And in this current year, we actually are um, showing that we are uh, operating in the black, which means we're bringing in more revenue than expenses. And so it's, it's looking like we're going back to normal. Uh, and normal is that we do not have to utilize or supplement the budget with taxpayer dollars. We have a comment that is sharing a concern about a private entity profiting off of the opioid crisis mm -hmm. in our community. And this crisis is not a business opportunity. It's an epidemic that our local right. health district, they feel is best suited to respond to. And the wraparound services, which I can understand that SRHD provides, are one reason why they feel treatment services should remain at SRHD, mm -hmm. um, like the needle exchange, and, and we recognize that, um, and some of the parent programs that we have, family and parent programs, mm -hmm. even if a nonprofit were to take over, there'd be a duplication of services, they feel like, for our community to take on, like HR, admin, Mm -hmm. um, billing, all of those things um, that could take money away from the actual treatment. These are mm -hmm. concerns they show. And maybe you can share, these are, these are good concerns that Absolutely. everyone shares. Yeah. And that was a big mouthful. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to address the components that like, if you want to repeat the first part, yeah. I'll address Just, that. You know, that, you know, it's not a business opportunity. They feel like SRHD is best right. suited to respond be and mainly because of our wraparound services yes. and that we already have, um, you know, the, the admin right. behind it. We already have that in place. So that is a really um, important point. And throughout this process, um, when I said that we, there's a lot of public healthy things that we do that we don't know if a private entity would do, um, that, that is critically important to the recommendation. Because for example, we have a very specific program for pregnant women who are, um, are wanting to address their addiction. And we like, we just really wrap them with services. And we also are one of the only um, opioid treatment programs that accepts the insurances that veterans have. And so we really focus on providing services to individuals who are veterans. And then one of the things I, I've, I've met with researchers that work with um, the opioid treatment program a lot. And one of the things that um, we hear over and over again is that the actual culture 
of the treatment services program at SRHD is one where our, um, our clients feel welcomed. They feel respected. They feel like we're part of a family. They're part of a family um, at our treatment services program. And so those are really important aspects of this study that are going to come out in the recommendation. Um, but I do want to make sure and clarify something. Our syringe exchange program is not part of treatment services. Treatment services is specific to the opioid treatment program, the medication assisted treatment of individuals with opioid addiction. And so our syringe exchange program is a function of SRHD's other programming. It is not done from within treatment services. And when it comes to um, like the HR and all of that, if, if we did separate, that all would fall on the new organization, if that makes sense. What was the next part? I think that, that was, I did think I that cover was it. it all? I, okay. I think so as best that we can, because that's the reason we're doing the study, right? Is to get yeah. answers to questions like that. Right. And, um, and then be able to make a Right. educated assessment, exactly. which we can't do yeah. right at this moment. Right. Um, one thing in the study that uh, um, attendee is hoping that we address is pair status with the clients. Mm -hmm. And if we're taking that into consideration. Yes, it, it is. Um, and because we know we haven't discharged a patient for inability to pay for services in um like at least five years. And so we, we have the ability to ensure that we're following every single possible way to help our clients stay on the program. And we accept Medicare, we accept Medicaid, we accept the VA insurance, we have self-pay, we have a sliding fee scale, um, we have various different funding streams that help us to um, augment, like on the sliding fee scale, we have funding that helps us to be able to backfill when an individual can't afford the full cost um, out of pocket if they're uninsured. And, um, so we, we also have a program where we can help people uh, figure out a payment schedule that they can, um, they can live with and still eat and still have gross, you know, still have gas money and that kind of thing. So um, that, those are things that, again, when I say public healthy things, um, that's, that's what I'm referring to. Um, we, we go above and beyond to ensure that our clients receive the services that are offered. Um, and again, um, right now we're hearing, we've heard from employees, we're hearing now from the community members, and um, we are just at the very beginning of looking at it, the entities that might be interested in taking on treatment services, would they be able to continue these types of services? Because it's critically important to us that if we separated, that our, um, our current clients wouldn't experience any barriers to access that their treatment quality would stay at the high level that we're, we're providing and that community needs were being met. Uh, I think there is concern when you talk about how great our staff is and yes. how kind we are and um, welcoming of our clients and our patients. Um, so that's a big concern is that um, when they hear about 
outside entities that are interested in possibly taking over treatment services, they also feel that their reviews aren't as good or they don't hear people that utilize them are not having as good a reviews for them as they are for us. So mm -hmm. how is that being considered or is the reviews or what you hear about those entities being considered in this study? Yes, absolutely. So it's, um, and, and this is a challenging um, topic to address because there, well, I'm going to talk about some of the conversations that I have had with our clients. And some of our clients have shared with me that they've gone to other opioid treatment programs where they felt like they were just a number and that they were just being kind of herded through the um, process without um, actually being seen as a person. Um, and that is not what we provide. And so as I begin talking with, talking with and also going and visiting and observing other uh, potential uh, entities that might want to consider um, taking on our treatment services, those are the very things that I'll be asking about and watching for. Um, so it is being very much taken into consideration. And then um, this next question, they're just um, recognizing the importance of the needle exchange program and that feel that by having treatment services, we're able to help manage the whole picture for those individuals. Right. You were introducing them to treatment services through needle exchange and then helping them on their road to recovery. Um, don't they think that, that you know, our community would benefit by us continuing to do that? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's just a concern maybe that they're trying to yeah. share. Uh, yeah, and that, that is a legitimate concern. Um, you know, where our treatment services, excuse me, our syringe exchange program right now, um, we, we do have the ability to refer to um, our own treatment services program, but we also um, make sure that all people who are using syringe exchange um, know what their options are because there are op other opioid treatment programs in uh, Spokane County um, and they are located, sometimes somebody might want to choose a different opioid treatment program based on location mm -hmm. and convenience. Um, so it's like when we are talking to people at the syringe exchange, we're not just telling them about our services. We're letting them know about all of the potential opportunities. And so there would be nothing that changed with that if our treatment services was to be um, taken over by uh, another entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me see a couple other comments. Um, um, this attendee feels, you know, that addiction is a public health matter. Yes. And it should be treated like other diseases that we have in the community and really feel that having public health involved assists the people that are being tra treated better and not being managed in a way that make them feel like they're being taken, adva taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And that they feel private companies are viewed as worried about the profit, not the actual treatment and care for the individual. Yeah. And I have heard that um, multiple times from our employees and as I mentioned from our clients that um, there are some OTPs that really the bottom line, the, the making the money 
is their primary objective. But I've also been made aware of other programs that they are really focused on the mission and the vision of helping people to overcome their addiction. And so that's part of this whole process is finding out, is there a good fit? Is there a good fit that it would be in the public's best interest to have that entity um, uh, take on our treatment services? And the reality is, is that if there's no one that's a good fit and that will continue providing the quality of care, the access to care, and focusing on community needs, um, then the recommendation will align with that finding. Yeah, there's um, a couple of people who asked about if we know how many other opioid program treatment programs right. there are in the county and mm -hmm. if they're community-based or if they're for profit. Mm -hmm. Do so we know that there's two other opioid treatment programs in um, that are providing the same services that we provide in Spokane County. And I am going to need to call upon Misty Chalinar again, um, because I'm not sure, I believe that both of them are for profit, um, but I'm not positive. So Misty, do you know if they're for-profit or not for-profit entities? Yes, they both are. And there's a third that is slated to begin services in Airway Heights through Kalispell. Okay. And, and, so, and that's a tribal. Okay. So the two that are currently operating right now in um, Spokane County, other than us, both of those are for-profit entities? Correct. Okay, and the, the tribal is just gearing up to get started and we don't, they would be a, a tribal government entity. Correct. Okay. Thanks, Misty. Yeah, thank you, Misty. Um, hold on, let me just read this one real quick. Okay. So I'm not, I, forgive me, whoever wrote this question, if I don't understand it correctly, you're asking about private programs. Why would a tax filing category have an impact on patient care versus a public entity? Oh, okay. Good. So I, yeah, <laughs> again, um, you're asking really good questions. And so what I've been able to gather so far in this process is, and I'm going to use um, uh, the, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, it's like the, um, uh, how, many, how many clients are on a counselor's caseload as an example. So what I've been told is that a for-profit opioid treatment program can have upwards of 130 clients on a single counselor's caseload. So that, that our maximum is right around 75 clients on a, a counselor's caseload. And so that directly speaks to quality of care. So if a counselor has a really large number of patients or clients on their caseload, it's like, can they really provide the quality of care that um, an individual needs to be able to be successful in their recovery? And um, again, that is another concern as I'm gathering data and I begin talking with other entities. 
it's like that will be a critical component because you know we want to make sure that if if we were to move forward to step two and then move forward to step three and then move forward to a request for qualifications to um, uh, separate, you know, identify someone who we would separate treatment services to, we have to make sure that it is in the public's best interest to do so. And all of the things that we've been talking about tonight um, are, would be indicators of whether or not it would be in the public's best interest. And you're also taking in other best interests. So the concern over if we were to separate treatment services from SRHD, are we also taking into consideration the best interest of treatment services employees and their current jobs, their same pay and benefits and those details. But yes, of course, that is, I mean, when we say in the community's best interest, that includes employees, it includes clients, it includes the larger community and the, uh, the role that we fill within Spokane County. And so absolutely, um, we are looking well, we will be looking because I've been really focusing on listening to employees. Now I'm really focusing on listening to community members and I'm starting just on the beginning stages of listening to um, other like programs that might be interested in taking on our services. And so I'll be asking really hard questions and um, it's, it's really going to, I, you know, I, right now I haven't had those conversations, so I don't have any information on what I'm going to find out. Um, but that's why we're doing this feasibility study. I think I've hit the, the end. We still have a few minutes left to accept questions. I'm just Wait, just wait one minute. Yeah. <laughs> See any more questions coming in? No thinking bubbles. Mm -hmm. well, I think we can conclude. Yeah. Okay. I just um I'd like to Thank you all for joining us today and offering these questions. These are exactly what we were hoping for is a really good discussion and address all of your concerns and um, include those when we're doing the feasibility study. So we appreciate you coming out today and appreciate your presence and your time. And as you saw, this is being recorded. So we'll be sure to share this so that if you know of others that weren't able to attend, uh, the three town halls that we have scheduled, then these would be available for them to view on our website. And I believe tomorrow morning at seven, at seven o'clock, we have another um, town hall meeting. Yep. Uh -huh. And then on Thursday, at we noon. have one at noon during the lunch hour. So please, please share with anyone else that you think might be interested in attending the town hall. And you're always welcome to attend another one if you come up with other uh, comments that you want to make sure are taken into consideration. Or that email, maybe we can share the communications yes. email on In the there chat. really quick mm -hmm. so that if you do think of them and you don't want to attend a town hall, that you can definitely send questions our way and we'll make sure that um, our leadership team and Alicia get the chance to answer. Yes. And will those uh, answers be posted on a website somewhere? Or how will they access the answers? Do you know? Well, we would that? reply to you in an email if you send oh, it to our communications yes. email box. <laughs> yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay I'm just letting, wait, letting Deanna post that email again. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Deanna, again. Thank you, everyone. And enjoy your evening. Thank you all.